on last night, we dealt with having weights that you can't lift by yourself. Um, this evening, I don't always give sermons titles, even though I may have researched them and gone through them. I just don't always do that. But I just want to talk with you guys this morning, this evening, about what you have. You have some powerful things. You have some powerful stuff in you. Um, you've got some incredible abilities within you, young people. And that's why the enemy is attacking you. And that's exactly why he's calling you. He's calling you through music, through hip hop, through the television programs and the books that you read, he's calling you. He's constantly beckoning to you, beckoning to you by the friends that you choose, the people that you associate with, the material that you allow into your mind, the um, websites that you have access to that you shouldn't have access to. He's calling to you because he's studying you. Well, he's calling to you because he wants to destroy you, but he calls you and he crafts his calling and his temptation just for your personality, just for your need and just for your, um, your sense of who you think you are, who, do, who you think you are not. And then what he does is he allows you and me to begin to buy into the negative self-talk that we, we do and we engage in to ourselves. For instance, who told you that being five foot ten and a hundred and five pounds was beautiful? No one other than Cosmopolitan magazine or some of these other model magazines or who told you that you were only handsome if you had a six to eight pack and that you had ripping muscles uh, glistening under the heat of the sun while you bathed in Vaseline? Who told you that? Yeah, the media, the print media, yes, the uh, television media, but the radio media speaks to you and calls to you today also. And it is like a wave that's constantly coming. It is constantly, unendingly, it comes and it beats up against us and it, it continues to tell us what we should be and what we shouldn't be. And, and, and many times we fall into temptation because we open Pandora's box and we allow ourselves to become curious. As Eve in the Garden of Eden, we become curious. And our curiosity gets the best of us. And our curiosity then leads to action, and our action then leads to oftentimes addictive behavior. I think of a lady that I pastored. I think of a young person that I pastored who, who, who wanted to experiment with something and try it out because friends were saying that it is a thing to try out. Friends were saying it is a thing to do. It is like, it, 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 it's like that young person who says to another young person, try it, you might like it, you may not, you, 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 believe me, it ain't that bad once you get used to it. It's all right. 
once you get over the initial shock of, you know, you just get used to it. And then the thing that used to, that used to detest you is the thing you now desire. The enemy calls to you. He beckons to you every day that you live. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. It's a verse that we've known a long time. Psalm 1 says, and verse 1. It reads like this, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And here's the promise. Now listen to this in verse 3. And it says, and he shall be like a river, a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Stop. Blessed is the man that sitteth not in the seat, sitteth not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Young people, what I want to ask you this evening is, who are your friends? Who are your mates, your associates? Who is it that you make time for? Who is it that you give time to? Who is it that you allow to influence you? There was an old saying back home that goes, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. In this day and age, when everybody has a prepackaged definition of what judgment means, no one likes to have or believes that they should have, that they have influence and that the people they hang with has influence and, have, and you're going to be evaluated if I hung out with known gangsters, people would automatically believe and assume that to some degree, I am a gangster. When people hear me or see me looking like, if I do that, look like Snoop Doggy whoop, Dog, they would believe that I'm Snoop Doggy Dog, or I'm, I'm affiliated with him somehow. And if I walk up in church and I said to people in church, good morning, for shizzle my nizzle, people would have many issues. People would have many issues, and rightfully so. For your friends, your speech, those you associate with say volumes, speak volumes of you. The places you go, the things you read, those become sometimes your animate and inanimate friends. But who do you hang with? Who do you associate with? Who do you give your time to? You know, it is true. It is true that God is looking for a generation of young people, young adults and the young at heart. He's looking for a generation that will not be ashamed of the gospel. He's looking for a generation that are seeking him. He's looking for a generation of young people that don't want to be entertained only. They don't mind having a good time in church, but he's looking for young people and he needs young people and he's depending and he's calling to young people. He's depending on young people who want to do the will of God, who want to do the work of God, who want to be in the way of God. They want to be on God's side. So young people, my brothers and my sisters, in spite of all of the peer pressure and despite all of the callings of the devil, God is looking and he believes that there are young people in New Zealand who want to be serious seekers of God. Seeking God. Does seeking God mean that I'm no longer a fun person or an intelligent person or someone who has a good time? No, but it means that 
my ways are going to please God. He's looking for young people, depending on young adults, who want to seek God in their interpersonal relationships, who want to seek God in their courting and in their dating. You see, take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. God is looking for young people that want to follow him. He's looking for young people that want to be a part of his work. Hmm. God is looking for young people who believe in Philippians 4, verse 13. Now listen to this. Read this with me. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which what? Strengtheneth me. God is looking for young people who believe that, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The time has come in this world's history and in New Zealand's history, the time has come where young people and young adults, it's time for you to cast off the works of darkness. It's time for you to let the works of darkness go. It's time for you to put away the proud spirit. It is time for you to give up the cigarettes. It is time for you to surrender premarital sex. It is time for you to stop the cussing and the bad language and, and the bad porno movies and the porno sites and the porno behavior. It is time, young people, that you cast off the works of darkness. The revival begins with you believing that God is looking for serious seekers. Not those who came to watch Noah build the ark and then laugh at him. God is looking for young people that will take God seriously. It says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ. So that means that I can repair a broken relationship with my mother or with my father. It may not be easy. It may mean some pain. It may mean some tears. It may mean that I may need counseling. I might need some help along the way. But I can do all things through Christ. If I don't do it for you, I'm doing it because of God. See, everything is not going to be motivated because of my love for you. And that's okay. There are some things that are motivated purely because of a love for God. There ought to be more things and most things motivated because of a love for God. When do we get over the fact that God does not owe us anything? When do we realize that God gave us everything that he could have possibly given us? Constantly. The enemy tries to make us forget what God has done. The enemy tries to make it seem like God has not done anything for us. The enemy tries to make us become so self-reliant until we believe that we got up on our own this morning. Some of us believe that we got up on our own. We, we, we breathe and move and have our being because of us. Oh, don't you know that everything belongs to God, even your body and your mind? It all belongs to God, and he's laid a claim on that. He's laid a hold on that, and young man and young lady, God is looking for you this morning, this evening, to be a serious seeker. He wants you to understand that he's looking for young adults and young people that want a serious, a deep-rooted connection with God. He does, see, you see, you can tell when people, you can tell when people are seeking God. Like the woman with the issue of blood. She didn't let the disciples dissuade her. She did not allow the priests and the Pharisees to dissuade her. She did not allow the Sadducees or the doctors to dissuade her. She was at the point of desperation. And when she heard that Jesus was coming by, she did all that she could just to touch the hem of his garment. She was seriously seeking God. But who are your friends? And the question has to be asked because some of you want God, but you're afraid to let other people know that you want God. Some of you want God and you know that you need him, but it may not look too cool to want God. 
Some of you want God, but you're looking for the pastor, again, to do cartwheel and backflips. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This thing is very serious. And while we play games, the devil is playing for keeps. While we fool around, the devil is targeting you. Oh, oh, and, and here's how it works. He may not get you today. He may not land that capture. He may not, he may not trap you today. But he is laying in wait for tomorrow, the next day. Your only defense and your only line of protection is to be a seeker of God. Now, does that mean that every temptation you may, you may pass? But there may be some that you fall and that you may scrape your knees and you may hit your head, but that's all right. That doesn't mean you stop becoming a seeker of God. But first of all, you got to want God. And you got to ask for God. And you got to believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 3, everybody. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs 3. I want you to look at this. I want you to begin at chapter 3. And I want you to read out, let me have a man read out for me Proverbs 3 and verse 3. Come on, give me a brother, somebody, give me a brother, read it. Read loud, my brother. Proverbs chapter 3. You have your Bible, turn there. What does it say? Let me have a sister to read the next two verses. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Why? Your only defense is to lean not in your own understanding, but to trust in the Lord. After you've done all your research, after you've done all of the research that you could possibly do, after you've, you've studied this and you've read that, the next thing to do and the, mo the thing you should do even during those processes is seeking God and asking him, Lord, which way shall I go? Lord, what will I do? What school should I go to, Lord? Lord, are these the kind of friends that I should be hanging with? You see, young people, who you hang with and who you deal with really does influence your thinking. And I know it would be nice and cute and entertaining and, and wonderful for us to say, you know what? I can win them. I can influence them. Yeah, you can. But you got to make sure that you're rooted in God. You got to make sure, young man, that you're rooted in God. So when the boys are hanging out on the corner and they're drinking their liquor or they're smoking their weed or they're doing whatever they do, you got to make sure, my brother, that you are not amongst those. You see, the Bible says in Psalms 1, blessed is the man. You see, sometimes you can be with the wrong crowd and still not, you still may not be doing what they do. But because you're with the wrong crowd at the wrong time, but you're in the right place, you can go down too. A young man a few years ago had a football scholarship to Washington State University. Handsome young man, strapping lad, 18 years old, had himself a scholarship, a full-blown four-year scholarship to play linebacker for Washington State. Decided that he was going to go to a friend's party on Saturday night after church. Went, wasn't doing anything wrong, but just hanging out at the wrong place. But at the right time, for a problem to take place. Shooting broke out. Some gang members got involved, got there, and came around and were messing around with the party. And he, uh, 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 one of his boys said, look, man, why don't you get out of here? Why don't you go home? 
And as he began to walk away from the house where he should never have been in the first place, he began to walk and somebody said, hey, where do you think you're going? And without looking back, he started running. And as he started running, a gunshot went off just as he was about to turn the corner. And as he was about to turn the corner, the bullet hit him in his back and ricocheted through his chest cavity and the boy died one hour later. I did the funeral. The funeral was jam-packed. Over 1,500 people and more, most of those were young people who loved and knew that young man. It was one of the saddest funerals I've ever conducted in my entire life. All of that potential, but because he was undecided in how he was going to, what decision he was going to make, because he was undecided and because he, he was undecided about the fact that you got to follow God. You see, young people, this young man had had Bible studies. He grew up in the church. He knew other Adventists. But he wanted to have God and he wanted to have the world. He wanted to think it was okay to be with God and he thought it was okay to go and party just a little bit. And maybe, Pastor, I'm not going to party. I'm going to just be at the party. I'm not going to club. I'm going to just go to the club. Come on, Pastor. I'm not going to smoke. I'm going to just be with the smokers. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to just be there with them while they're drinking, Pastor. Come on, man. Give me a break. Sometimes, young people, as we grew up growing ho back home, my mother and them used to say, a hard head makes a soft bottom. Yeah. The book of Psalms and Proverbs are books about practical wisdom, common sense living. That young man, not only did he lose out on his scholarship, he lost his life, and his mother grieved for many years. Young people, I want you to seriously consider who it is that you hang out with, who it is that you spend time with, who it is that you, you believe are your homies, but really they're phonies. Who is it, young people, that you hang out with? Who is it that you give your time to, and how do they influence you? Well, I'm talking to you this evening about being a serious seeker of God. Why? Because when you're following God and when you're seeking God, there, you, you, it, it's not going to be easy. But you've got to understand that there will be people, who, even in the church, there will be hypocrites. Even in the church, there will be people who are still trying to figure out things. And they're not perfect. But when you're seeking God, they, 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 their issues can't stop you. Now, why am I talking to you about seeking God? Why am I talking to you about being a serious seeker of God? I'm talking to you about that because the time is late. The hour for Jesus to return is almost here. He's on his way, and things are lining up, and events are lining up, and issues are lining up. And all that can be ready for Jesus should be ready for Jesus to come. Jesus is coming again, young people. He is coming for young men and young ladies who are serious about seeking him. Don't you understand that while we may be talking about being people of the remnant, you are not the remnant if you're not seeking God. Just because your name is on the church roll, just because your daddy and your mama might be Adventists, or your grandparents were Adventists, or your great, 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 G -g 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 great grandparents were Adventists. It doesn't mean that you have the right relationship with God. And it does not matter. God is looking for Adventist young people, Christian young people, people who are seeking Him. So it doesn't necessarily shake down to what denomination you are. What it shakes down to is are you seeking God? And yes, there are going to be people who discover these truths and these doctrines and these beliefs and these people are going to embrace these things. Why? Because they have a love for Jesus already. See, without that love for Christ, you won't seek Christ. You know, one day, the church that I attend had a big old event. 
had a huge event going on. And I had to go preach at one of the other churches. And one of the things that happened was that there were a lot, a lot, a lot of people in this church. A whole lot of people in the church. When I got back, so I went to preach at the church and I decided, you know, I said, I'm going to go back to my home church because my wife and my family are there. When I got to the church, I had to park about four blocks away from the church because it was so many people. But I went back to the church in the afternoon. This was for an afternoon concert program. And, and I went back to the church and I said, man, where's Lindsay? And people were saying, hey, Pastor Pollard, how you doing? And they were talking to me and they were saying hi to me. But you got to understand something. I was seeking Lindsay. I was looking for Lindsay. I was determined to find Lindsay. Nothing was going to stop me from finding Lindsay. I was looking for Lindsay. My life wasn't complete until I found Lindsay. All right? And I wanted to find my baby. I wanted to find her. So while people were pulling at me, hey, pastor, would you pray for me? Not now. Nah. Would you look, would you not? No. I got to find Lindsay. When I saw Lindsay and she saw me, she just happened to be up there with the praise team getting ready to sing. And when she saw me and I saw her, we looked at each other and we smiled. Oh, you wanted to pray? Come on, let's pray. But I was driven by just finding Lindsay. I was seeking her. You've got to know something, that there'll be many distractions that call unto you. There'll be many things that pull at you. There'll be many people who try to distract you. Some of them, some of those people might be your husband. Some of those people might be your wife. Some of those people that distract you or call you from God's path for your life might be your friends. They might be your, your daddy or your mama. They might be somebody who you highly respect. But you've got to know that God has called you. And when you understand that God has called you, you are going to be seeking God. Why are you going to seek God? You're going to seek God because you realize that in him is life, in him is health, in him is sanity, in him is surety, in him it is peace. For some of y'all, you need peace in your lives. Young people, your problem with smoking, your problem with weed, your problem with premarital sex is not because of all of the books out there. Those books may tell you stop, stop, stop. But unless you have the love of Jesus in your heart, you won't have the power. And you got to have the love of Jesus in your heart. That is what is going to break through that power. That's what's going to break through your desire for the nicotine. That's what's going to break through your desire for the, for the drug, for the high. When you get high in Christ and you experience his love and you experience his power, your body may still call out to you. Your habits, your bad habits may still beckon unto you but you'll run to find some help. And I dare believe, I dare say to you that that help is Jesus. You know, you know, 2 Timothy says to us, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Look at these signs of the times. Verse 3, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers, now listen to this, y'all, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And look here. It says, from such 
turn away. Here we are at this midpoint of this meeting. About to end, actually. Tomorrow night, Friday night, Sabbath morning, then my wife and I, we get ready to go back to Los Angeles to pick up our duties. And the question for you here in Auckland and New Zealand is what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with the best friend you could ever have, Jesus? Last night, y'all had fun. We had a good time. And we ought to have a good time in Christ. But let's never forget that while we're laughing, these things are deeply serious. The times demand serious attention. Young people, young adults, it's time to take the call of Christ seriously. He says... Come unto me, all ye that are laden and heavy laden. Come unto me, all you that are burdened. And you've got heavy burdens and you're laden heavily. He says, take up my yoke upon me. It's easy. It's light. And talking with some of you around the tent, around the campgrounds, I'm privileged, I'm proud of the fact that you've, you've asked us to pray with you and talk. I, I'm, 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 my heart is moved. We, we are humbled because of that. We love you for that. We, we will always remember you for that. We, we, we will always cherish our time here in New Zealand with you. Don't you ever forget that. Know that. From, from Pastor Nick and Pastor Eddie to you, to the musicians, to everybody that we've met, you all have been absolutely wonderful and at the end of the day, I still have to ask the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? Why? Because I plan on seeing Jesus in heaven, and I plan on seeing you there too. But it's got to start here where young people seriously are seeking Christ. It's got to start here. Heaven has got to start now with young men and young ladies who are seeking for a closer relationship with God. Not about trying to figure out how many steps to take on the Sabbath or how much cheese not to eat or trying to figure out when to drink after you eat. No! All of those things may be healthy and good, but, but that's not salvation. You can do all of that and still not know Jesus. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us of the story between the sheep and the goats. I'm about to end, so stay with me. He tells us that the sheep and the goats, he said, they did the same thing. They gave clothes away to those who were hungry. They painted, I mean, gave clothes to those who were naked, fed those who were hungry, painted buildings and painted fences and visited those who were in prison. And they did all of the same behaviors. And yet, there came down, it came down to one thing. He said, depart from me to the goats, all ye workers of iniquity, and enter into everlasting damnation. And the question is, why did Jesus say, why, why would people who did the same thing, why would people who took a part, took of the same ministries, why would people who were at the same events, why would people who sang the same praise songs, who went to the same church, why would people who, who, who gave tithe and offerings, why would people who were nice guys, they were nice people, why would good people, why would the Lord say to good, nice, kind people, okay, they may not be Christian, but they're good people anyhow, why would he say to them, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity? He says it. Because the actuating power for performing those behaviors were not the same. If we do some things out of habit, I'm sorry, that ain't good enough. That don't cut it. 
just because you do it up, that is not a reason for you. God don't owe you heaven. It's about those who love God. It's about those who've decided that they're going to seek God no matter what happens. It does not cut it. To do it out of habit is not it. And you got to get beyond that. You've got to seriously seek God. You got to hunger for him. You got to say like David, Lord, my heart panted after you. As a deer panted after water, my heart wants you. You got to get there, folks. Young lady, you got to get there. Young man, you got to get there. You got to get there. So in Matthew 25, it's clear that the behaviors may be the same, but the results will be different. As long as we play games, as long as we want something to tickle our ears and give us a warm fuzzy, as long as we hold on to our preferences and we want this and we like that and we don't want that, we don't like this one, we don't like that one, we don't want this and we don't want that and we don't like, and we don't do it like that. Good. Look. However you do or do not do it, if it does not end up in you seriously seeking Jesus because of a love for Jesus, because of a desire for Jesus, I don't care if you're in New Zealand, Australia, North America, the continent of Africa, China, Timbuktu, wherever, we will end up missing out on heaven. If our love for Christ, if it's not about seeking him. Now, I asked you earlier, who are your friends? I asked you earlier because... The Bible, two can't walk together unless they agree. And I would encourage you to follow, to find friends that love Jesus, young people. Amen. Young adults, find some friends that love Jesus. You know, let me tell you all a story, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to end. I had, when I was growing up, come on, Kyle, when I was growing up, I had some friends back in Louisiana. They, those were my boys. Those were my homies. It's my boon coon, my buddies. And we played on the football team together. We lifted weights together. Stay with the preacher. We lifted weights together. We played football together. We worked out together, all of that stuff. We hung out together, but one night under a tent, I heard a preacher talking about Jesus Christ. And I was around 17 years of age. I was about 17, and I heard, I heard this man talking about Jesus, and I knew who Jesus was supposed to be. I knew who he was. You see, I grew up around the church. I grew up around people who were Adventist people. I, I had cousins, Reverend Robinson, who was a Baptist preacher. I had these people in my, in, my, in my line of view and things of that nature, but I hadn't taken God seriously. But I, I did take football seriously. I did take baseball seriously. And I decided that what I wanted to do was I was going to try for a scholarship. And, I, and, and, and so I tried to hang out with the guys that I thought could help me get a scholarship. And I decided that, you know, you know I'm going to work out with these guys. We're going to hang out. We're going to be cool and this and that. It's going to be all good. But one of the things that happened was I heard this man preaching. And this man was preaching about you can run, but you can't hide. That man preached that sermon, you can run, but you can't hide. You can try to run to, to, to the hills, but he'll find you. You can run to the deepest part of the sea, but he'll send a whale to come get you. The man said, you can run to the top, to the highest point of a mountain, but he'll send an eagle to come up there and get you. He said, the east, he'll find you. and the west, he'll find you. He said, no matter what, you can't run from God. And he said, and he made an appeal, and he almost looked at me. It was as if he, he said, you, do you hear God calling you? Now, I don't know if he was talking to me or not. But when I heard him, something in me moved. 
And I was compelled. I was pulled. And I said, Lord, I'd never really called on the name of the Lord. I said, Lord, is, is this what I'm supposed to do? And the man kept talking about the joy and the peace of finding the Lord. Well, I decided, I went up there and I said, look, I, I, I want y'all to know, I'm not quite sure, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow this thing for a little bit, but I'll see what's happening, I'll see what's going on, and uh, I'm not quite sure. So I said, okay. I went into Bible study, started studying. I decided I was going to change my life, and I was going to give God the chance to change my life. At the age of 17, When I got baptized, when I was about to get baptized, I told my boys, I said, fellas, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to get baptized. And they said to me, oh, blank, you ain't going to do nothing. You ain't going to do, oh, blank, blank, blank. You ain't going to do nothing, Ronald. I said, yes, I am. I'm going to become a Christian, man. I want to I wanna follow the Lord. They said, man, that's stupid. Look at you, boy. You know, we gonna, we, man, you, you can't be no Christian and, and do what we're talking about doing. I said, yeah, I want to be a Christian. I don't know where it's going to go, but I want to follow Jesus. And the man said, and, and then he said to me, well, look, you go ahead on. You keep Jesus. You keep Jesus for you. Don't be preaching to us about no Jesus. Don't be talking to me about no Jesus. It's right for you, but it ain't right for me. I said, okay. They came, Sabbath came, and I got baptized. The next, that Monday, I went to school. Well, holy boy, how does it feel to be a Christian? Holy boy, holy boy, look at you, holy boy. Now, so I guess you can't play football no more, huh, holy boy, holy boy. And called me all kind of names and stuff like that and started making fun of me and ridiculing me. And I said, man, I thought y'all were my boys. I thought y'all were my friends. They said, man, look. Man, you, you, you join the church? Uh-uh, man, we don't want to hear that. I said, well, look, let me tell y'all, since y'all messing with me, and since y'all dogging me out and y'all talking about it, I might as well tell y'all this too. They said, what? They said, what? I said, I think the Lord's calling me to be a minister. They said, hold on. They, and he said, what the blank are you talking about? Uh, he said, you just got baptized on Saturday. He said, and I still understand why they go to church on Saturday, but you just got baptized on Saturday, and here it is Monday, and how you go from getting baptized to now believing that you're supposed to be a preacher? I said, I just believe the Lord is calling me to be a preacher. So, you know, we went through the year. We were hanging out. We were talking, and, you know, we, we, they did the best they could at the time. I went off the year I graduated. I went off to Oakwood College. They went to um, University of Louisiana, uh, LSU. One became a football player. A couple of them became football players. I went to Oakwood and became a theology major, became a pastor. I graduated from Oakwood, got a call to the ministry, became a minister. These young men got called to play football for the Detroit Lions. One of them in particular, Gary James, played for the Detroit Lions. While, making a, while running around the end, catching the American football, catching the pass, and running around the end, his hamstring went out on him, pulled on him. He didn't complete the rest of the season. The following year, the Detroit Lions drafted a running back by the name of Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders is a Hall of Fame running back today. The year after they drafted Barry Sanders, the year they drafted Barry Sanders, they cut Jerry, Gary James from their team. He had no career, he had no more future because he didn't complete his education. I went home one summer. I saw Gary James and he said to me, "Man, I probably should have did what you did. I should have chose to become a Christian. He said, man, and I said, well, Gary, what happened to all of that money you made? Come on, come on. He, I said, what happened? Y'all can get to the piano for me. I said, what happened to all that money you made? He said, man, I blew it. I lost it. I said, you lost it? He said, yeah. Young people, there's nothing that's guaranteed except 
your relationship with Christ. The only thing that is guaranteed is your relationship with Christ. I tried to choose, and for a while I tried to play games between Christ and my friends, Christ and the world. But let me tell you something. You can't have both of them. You got to choose Jesus. But whatever you do, you got to make a choice. And we want you to choose Christ. We want you to seek him. And that's just it in a nutshell. I can tell you more about it and everything. And, but no, that's just it in a nutshell. I became a Seventh-day Adventist minister and have never regretted it one day of my entire life. My childhood friend does not have what he thought he would have. He saw riches, he saw fame, he saw glory, he saw magazine covers, he saw himself on Sports Illustrated, trying to do the Heisman. He thought he could see himself on different international magazines, but no, he never broke through. But here, later, later, I can tell you it was worth choosing Jesus. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I don't care what mistakes you may have made. I don't care what problems you may have had. It matters not. Just let the Lord know that you want to seek him. And, and you tell him what may be the thing that's hindering you from seeking him. Let him know the thing that may be stopping you from serving him with all your heart. Let him know that I want to seek you, Lord. I want to follow you. I want to, I, I want to be possessed of your power. Lord, I want your power in my life because I want to seek you, Jesus. And while seeking him, you'll find that you'll have power. 2 Timothy 3 tells us that these are perilous times we're living in. God's looking for young people. He's looking for young people. Listen to the words of this song. As Lindsay sings this song to you, and as you feel moved, Give the Lord your heart. Give the Lord your heart and give him your mind. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.